Hi, everyone. Welcome to the third event in our Act Now series for the 2021 season. Arts citizenship talks are presented in a variety of formats and encourage conversation about arts and activism. I'm Jane Hirschberg, Assistant Director for Campus and Community Engagement at the Clarice, and I'm excited to be here with you. Tonight, we will experience work by Brazilian singer and songwriter, Xenia França, and by Maryland-based visual artist, Chanel Compton. Then the amazing Juju Bay will moderate a conversation between the two artists, which will be followed by an opportunity for you to ask questions. You can find more information about the artists and moderator, and also a translation of the song Shenya sings in the video, along with images of Chanel's work in the event guide that is linked in the chat. I wanna extend a special thanks to Malik Glee for his help in designing tonight's event. Also our translator for Shenya, Pablo Regis de Oliveira. And I wanna welcome our ASL interpreters, Valerie McMillan and Marina Martinez. As you enjoy tonight's event, we invite you to take a moment to reflect on and acknowledge the indigenous roots of the land that you're on. Every community owes its existence and vitality to generations from around the world who contributed to their hopes, dreams, and energy to making the history that led to this moment. Some were brought here against their will. Some were drawn to leave their distant homes in hope of a better life. And some have lived on this land for more generations that can, than can be counted. Truth and acknowledgement are critical to building mutual respect and connection across all barriers of heritage and difference. The Artist Partner Programs at the Clarice believes that artists can be catalysts for community change, leadership, and empowerment. And we have chosen to begin the effort of building bridges across cultures by acknowledging what has been buried by honoring the truth. The Clarice Smith Performing Arts Center and the University of Maryland are on the ancestral lands of the Piscataway people who were among the first in the Western hemisphere to encounter European colonists. And we honor the enslaved who assisted with the creation of this university. We pay respects to these and other elders past and present. Please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, immigration and settlement that bring us together here today. We encourage you to use a resource like native-land.ca to learn more about the indigenous roots of the land you are on right now. A link to this website is also available in the chat and the comments. Now let's welcome to the virtual stage, Genia Franca, Chanel Compton and Juju Bay. We will watch a video featuring Shenya, and then we will see some of Chanel's work as she tells us about it. Juju will ask the artists a few questions, and then you will have an opportunity to ask some of your own. After the conversation, we welcome you all to visit our virtual lobby. The Zoom link will be shared in the comments after the Q&A. Tonight, we'll be, we'll be joined by, some, by, by the artists who are participating in this conversation. Again, thank you so much for joining us in the cloud for ACT NOW, Decolonize Your Influence, African Spirituality in Contemporary Art and Music. Thanks. Me bege, paro e beje é, é gêmeo E calundo só zanga a baiana, o baiano Que são lembrados na folia em fevereiro Aruanda, aganju, azul, nudo Ajaiu, palavra velha longa 
longe da onomatopeia De tapar o sol com uma peneira Escantear o índice na prateleira Não fecha a conta, a cota é pouco e o corte é fundo E quem estanca sabe o choque do terceiro mundo De vez em quando um abre a boca sem ser oriundo Para tomar pra si o estandarte da beleza, luta e o dom Papo tão em fundo Por que Tu me chama se não me conhece Por que Tu me chama se não me conhece Por que Tu me chama se não me conhece É gêmeo E Calundu, sua zanga A baiana, o baiano E são lembrados na folia Em fevereiro A Ruanda, a Ganju A Zona do A Jair Palavra velha longe Da uma matapéia De tapar o sol com uma peneira Escantear o índice Na prateleira não fecha a conta, a cota é pouco e o corte é fundo E quem estanca a o choque do terceiro mundo De vez em quando um abre a boca sem ser oriundo Para tomar pra si o estandarte da beleza, a luta e o dom Com um papo tão em fundo Por que tu me chama se não me conhece? Chanel Compton, and I'm the executive director for the Maryland Commission on African American History and Culture, as well as the Banneker Douglas Museum, Maryland State Museum on African American History. Uh, and I'm also an artist. Um, I will be presenting uh, today um, works that, um, well, let me just back up. So the works that I'm gonna be presenting um, 
express Black diasporic experiences, history, and identity through a series of portraits and abstract figurative mixed media paintings. Um, I turn my video back on. Uh, I create these works in a uh, passionate and poetic manner that explores the physical and spiritual conflicts of external and internal uh, liberation. Um, as a representation of people of African descent, as a Black woman um, throughout the Americas, uh, this work that I'm presenting um, references the growing fight um, and aim for cultural and personal preservation. Uh, to further uh, examine the nature of resistance and transformation through a diasporic lens, uh, the materials that I use is palm wine, uh, red wine, and painted paper. Uh, so palm wine is a, um, a significant in West African uh, communities, including Yoruba, Ashanti, and uh, Akan cultural groups. Um, so since pre-colonialism, palm wine um, is used as a traditional drink. Um, during celebrations, home gatherings, and libations. Um, so, but it's juxtaposed um, with red wine uh, that symbolizes Christian influence and colonial rule. So these two mediums create a dichotomy within these works uh, and my figurative works. The images are created by like ripped pieces of paper and materials uh, to reinforce this idea of, of strength and, trans and transformation through historic oppression. So my work is incredibly physical, a lot of ripping, a lot of tearing, and a lot of rebuilding. Uh, many of the works are inspired by my education work, my community arts work, working in museums, and my um, arts educational work in, Sao Paulo, in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and Bahia, as well as Brasilia, and uh, most recently in Havana, Cuba. So these works that you see um, are referencing uh, Nat Turner, uh, who led a slave rebellion in, to the left in um, uh, Virginia. The right is of Charles Ball, um, who was once enslaved and was freed and fought in the War of 1812 uh, in Maryland. Uh, so, uh, they're very large, um, and I wanted to create these very close up, intimate shots of how I imagine uh, these men appear to be. Uh, and the next image. Uh, so these works, um, uh, again, um, you know, you see this silhouette of this man and on the left hand side, uh, which is the most recent work of mine. Uh, versus um, the right-hand side of young Martin. And um, I'm referencing Martin Luther King using a quote that he used in his last speech in 1968, the Mo mountaintop speech um, where he was fighting for workers' rights. Uh, and, but I wrote it in Spanish. And um, uh, he says on the, in, in his last words in the speech were, I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. And I wrote that shortly after my trip to Havana, Cuba, and um, the influences um, Black liberation has had um, throughout the Americas. So I wanted to pay an homage to Black liberation for Black people um, in Spanish-speaking countries. Um, and then on the left side, I just, you know, I'm really playing with, you know, Blackness as this cosmic spiritual thing, like Black absorbs everything, right? Um, and the, the uh, materials that I'm using, which is palm wine and red wine soaked in paper, so soaked paper and palm wine and red wine, it almost looks like bandages, but armor at the same time. So I'm playing with these ideas about identity, about Blackness, about the transatlantic slave trade about pain and about rebuilding and transformation. And the next slide. So 
So this is one of my most recent works uh, entitled Deep Roots Rising Water. And I wanted to do um, a piece interpreting um, an iconic photo of, uh, of a man, um, his name was, his first name was known as Peter. Um, and he was, in, he escaped uh, a plantation, um, the Bridget and Lion, Bridget and Lion, I'm sorry, sorry, John and Bridget Lion Plantation in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Uh, and he um, escaped, he um, escaped to a civil uh, uh, Union Army internment camp um, that was located in Louisiana. And these, the photos that you see were taken from a, a medical doc, a doctor. Uh, and the way he, and then later Peter joined the Union Army. Um, little is known of him after what happened to him after the Union Army, um, after the Civil War, but this photo was uh, almost like a mass media um, depiction of what slave enslavement was like in the South. So it was almost a, what we think of like uh, um, uh, the civil rights era, how that was depicted in news broadcasting. That was an early depiction of that. Um, an early rendition of that. And so I wanted to do a reinterpretation of this iconic photo that depicted the horrors and atrocities of enslavement for African-Americans and also a very re re real um, condition for um, African-Americans who were enslaved. And I wanted to create a new uh, abstracted interpretation of that um, that um, brought in elements of water, that brought in elements of, of pain, of armor, and the pieces, the pieces of paper almost look like bandages. So I wanted to create this visual metaphor of the African-American diasporic experience um, that represented um, uh, pain, beauty, and transformation and strength, um, which I believe Peter represented and many other African Americans and people of African descent um, represented through through the slave trade um, and through enslavement. Um, and that's my work. Uh, and I'm just happy to be here. Um, so I look forward to further exploring um, these topics in the, the discussion. Hello, everyone. Hi to everyone watching. Thank you, Chanel, for sharing your work with us. And thank you, Jenya, also for showing your video. I'm really excited to talk to you both. It's been great uh, connecting and glad we get to do it in this space as well. Thank you to Act Now. So let's just get right into the questions. Um, so um, the first question that I want to ask is how you both understand ancestral connection because both of you refer to ancestors and ancestral work in your art. And I'm curious how um, your respective artwork, like the instruments you use, the movements or materials, et cetera, that have aided you in understanding yourself as well as connecting to your ancestors. Um, so um, since Chanel was just talking, let's go to Shania first and then we'll go to Chanel. Hi everyone, um, I'm so glad to be here. Um, now I'm speak, I will speak Portuguese. Uh, primeiro eu quero agradecer ao convite por, por participar, eu estou muito feliz, muito um, animada com esse momento de poder me conectar com outras pessoas é, da diáspora através do meu trabalho. É, também quero parabenizar a Chanel pelo trabalho incrível que ela desenvolve, faz todo sentido para mim, tudo que ela diz, e quando eu vejo as imagens, as imagens brilhantes dela, eu realmente me sinto muito conectada com que, com que ela está querendo transmitir. So, Zenia wants to thank everyone and thank you for the invitation. She's very happy um, to be here and to connect with diaspora through her work. And also wants to uh, congratulate Chanel on her work. It's fantastic. And uh, she identifies with uh, what she was explaining as well as the artwork. 
Ah, o meu trabalho, ele é uma expressão da minha vivência. É, eu nasci na Bahia, eu hoje vivo em São Paulo, que é a região sudeste do Brasil, mas eu nasci no Nordeste, numa cidade do Recôncavo chamada Candeias. E como em várias partes do Ocidente, o Brasil, aliás, foi o primeiro país a receber né, pessoas escravizadas vindas da África. E por causa disso, o impacto da cultura é, na Bahia é muito é, profundo. Naturalmente, isso se expressa é, na comida, no, em to, na, na cultura como um todo, na comida, na música, na dança, nas formas, nas infinitas formas de expressão. A gente tem uma festa gigantesca é, chamada Carnaval, que é basicamente os ritmos e toda a identidade dessa festa que traz gente do mundo inteiro para cá, está é, profundamente enraizada na cultura é, vinda de África, né? E por causa disso, a minha influência principal é essa, é essa ancestralidade muito intrínseca e muito viva é, até hoje, é, principalmente através da religião, a religião que, que é chamada Candomblé, que é uma região que foi organizada e criada no Brasil, com a junção de várias pessoas de várias partes da África, do continente africano, e que precisavam expressar sua religiosidade. E aí, por causa disso, é, a Bahia é um lugar, uma plataforma muito especial e de acesso muito grande a essa ancestralidade. So, Zenia's, Zenia's work comes from her experiences. Zenia's from Bahia, from a city called Candeias, and she moved to São Paulo, the uh, metropolis, which is in the southeast, so from the northeast to the southeast. And Brazil was uh, the first country to receive uh, en masse slaves, and that had a very deep impact, which we see uh, in the culture. We see it in the music, in the food, in all cultural expressions. And it's uh, embodied in the gigantic festival that we know as Carnival, um, which is deeply rooted in African culture. And ancestrality for her is something that's very living. And it's especially present in uh, religion, which is in Candomblé, which was created and organized in Brazil from peoples and cultures from the African continent um, to be able to express themselves. And so for this reason, Bahia is a platform from which she draws um, her inspiration. E por causa disso, né, por causa desses desdobramentos é, culturais, é, a música brasileira não é, de, não é diferente com a música brasileira, que tem infinitos ritmos e, 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 e infinitas manifestações artísticas que provêm dessa diáspora, é, infelizmente forçada, mas que criou uma identidade muito forte aqui no Brasil e com certeza, inevitavelmente, não só por eu ter nascido na Bahia, mas porque o Brasil realmente está estruturado é, em cima de, dessa cultura, dessa miscigenação, mas basicamente por causa dessa cultura, da cultura vinda de África e também dos povos originários do Brasil, que a gente chama, que é conhecido como indígenas. Então, naturalmente, essa musicalidade, a minha musicalidade provém a minha forma de me expressar e, na verdade, por causa das, dos efeitos negativos é, que, que, a, que a escravidão causou, né? todos os efeitos negativos que a escravidão causou, existem muitas... É, muitos fragmentos, muitas partes soltas e muitas coisas esquecidas. Na nossa conversa, na nossa primeira conversa, eu usei uma analogia sobre um vaso quebrado, estilhaçado, e que a gente agora precisa ficar é, catando esses caquinhos para poder a gente reconfigurar o nosso sistema, para poder se autoentender, para criar uma identidade própria. E aí eu posso dizer que a música, com certeza, é o meu veículo, a minha ferramenta para acessar a minha ancestralidade, é através da, da música que eu tenho acesso à, à minha ancestralidade. É um processo bastante é, pessoal, mas que hoje eu vejo, tanto no Brasil quanto no mundo, muita gente, muitos jovens, muitos artistas, 
em busca dessa, desse, dessa, dessa religação, desse religare, né? com essa ancestralidade, em busca de a gente conseguir saber onde é que a gente está, para que futuro nós estamos construindo. Então, eu acredito que é inevitável que a arte que eu, que eu fosse fazer fosse uma arte que reverenciasse a minha ancestralidade, mas muito pautada também no que eu percebo hoje, em como eu estou hoje, muitas coisas que eu venho aprendendo, constante aprendizado, eu não sabia até cinco anos atrás. Então, é um, um processo bastante lento e também a música e o meu trabalho acaba me dando a oportunidade de, de viver momentos com, como esse e me conectar com outras pessoas negras de outras partes do mundo para a gente é, trocar, trocar informações e trocar vivências. É isso. Uh, so this, um, this work um, is, comes from, um, from the diaspora that was forced into Brazil um, but it also created a strong Brazilian identity. And um, this is made up, uh, Brazilian culture is, is structured on top of this African and indigenous people's cultures. Um, Genia's music um, is the expression of this. Um, there is also the negative effects that have come from slavery and many forgotten things that we have out of this. Uh, Genia compares this to a broken vase in which uh, we need to find all the separate pieces to be able to restructure our system and create our own new identities. And her music is, is based on this and that is a tool that she uses to access her ancestrality. So it's a very personal process um, to, to reconstructing your ancestrality. But at the same time, uh, she notices that many artists globally are also searching for their ancestrality, um, to understand the past, but also to create a new future. Um, and this is how she uses music uh, to revere and respect her ancestors and uh, to understand how she is now and understand what she's learning today. So it's a very slow process, but through this music, she's able to express herself and reconnect with other persons in the Black diaspora. Thank you so much, Shania. Uh, Chanel. Thank you, Shania. Um, well, my work is um, inspired by my my experiences, mostly most recently my experiences that I'm afforded working at a museum, um, pre predominantly African American museum. So before the Banneker Douglas Museum, you know I worked as the museum educator and the, later on the uh, executive director of the Prince George's African American Museum. And with that, um, in museum education, you do this uh, deep dive, of course, um, in exploring and researching uh, African American history and culture, because um, that's a part of your work. But for me, I needed a place to unpack all of that. So when I would read um, um, autobiographies of enslaved African-Americans, or when I would um, take a, um, go on a mural um, uh, trip, series trip to um, Brazil to further explore Afro-Brazilian history and culture and the connections to um, specifically Maryland African, African-American culture. I still, it was learning black history, learning the real American history in general is incredibly agitating. It's incredibly inspiring, but it's definitely for myself, um, um, I, I need, I, art is my savior. You know what I mean? And being able to um, make sense of all of that in ways that a research paper or a class or a presentation just can't. Um, so um, I use my studio space um, as a place of um, personal and, and spiritual um, exploration where sometimes it doesn't make sense to me. Like, what am I doing? I have no idea and it makes sense. It will make sense later on. Um, through these types of discussions, <laughs> but, um, 
but I for sure where I'm definitely 10 toes deep down on is that my work is about um, black identity. It is about um, um, this uh, synthesization of African, African or African heritage, but also European colonial heritage as well. Um, and what that, what that means and what cultures were developed out of that. Um, what violence came out of that, but also what beauty and strength came out of it as well. Um, so I think that's kind of like the elements that are in my work that I tried to interpret um, physically and artistically. Those are the thoughts that kind of go through my head. And I think for me, just, you know, I grew, I grew up in, well, Christian for the most part. And having this introduction to Black cultures, um, at first in Brazil, but then being introduced to it to um, in the United States, it kind of like unlocked this thing that I'm like, damn, like I really wish that I was introduced to Cuns and Blay. I wish I was introduced to the Orishas earlier in my, because growing up, you, you, you're so like conditioned. And this is very, this is a component of white supremacy to demonize our African heritage and spiritual selves. And so I'm like, I'm glad that I have, was gifted this, you know, through my museum work, but I wish I would have, I would have been introduced to it earlier, just growing up you know, um, but I'm looking forward to passing it down, so. Thank you so much. When both of you all talk about your work, the word that came to my mind was a portal. And so like this space that you all are creating to be able to connect to the diaspora, to be able to connect with yourselves or the ancestors. So thank you all for sharing your answers with that. My next question is, you actually just brought up the Odisha, so good transition. Um, in both of your works, you include references to the Orisha. Um, Chanel, I know that you have a piece that's entitled Oya. We didn't see it today, but Oya, for those who don't know, is a, a Yoruba female deity of the winds and storm and chains. And Janya's video of Pra Ke Me Shamas uh, mm -hmm. encompasses imagery from the Afro-Brazilian religion of Candomblé, which she talked about a little bit. Um, and, and in it, it names different Orishas or different deities such as Alekbara and Ibeji. So I'm curious how the Orisha have manifested in your life and art and why did you find it important to include, you know, religious and spiritual references in your art pieces? Um, and Chanel, actually, let's start with you and then we'll go to Jean Yannick. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just gonna make it, well, for me, I needed, I was actually going through a pretty tough time um, when I created that piece. Um, as young black women do, as young women do, you know, the young black women, you know, we go, we go through times. And so I needed something to like look to, to kind of charge me up, you know, that wasn't, that was, that was a black woman, you know, that was other, mm -hmm. that was beyond, you know, the gaze of white supremacy that was on beyond the gaze of patriarchy that was just the embodiment of, of, of strength um, and transformation. And so I just, it just resonated with me and it, it made sense with the materials that I was using. Um, and I just felt when I made it, I was, it just vibrated all over my body. Like I just felt in my mind and in my spirit and I just felt like it just felt so right. Um, so, and it made sense because the pieces that I typically make are people who I really admire, either family members or historical figures. So I wanted to create something um, that connected all of that, but in a, a, but on a spiritual plane. Yeah. Thanks. Shania. Um, esse é um trabalho de ressignificação de existência, basicamente, né? É... 
ao longo do, da minha vida, eu, tenho, eu, eu, eu vivo mergulhada dentro de um ambiente que é o lugar que eu nasci. A Bahia é um lugar que respira essa ancestralidade, né? Salvador, que é uma das cidades mais conhecidas do Brasil, se não a cidade mais conhecida do Brasil, é uma cidade que, que tem é, distribuída na, na cidade é, imagens de orixás, é, conviver com a ideia também de que os orixás são elementos da natureza, né? Ah, Oiá é o vento, né? Xangô é o raio, Iemanjá são as águas do mar, Oxum são as, as águas do rio, então essas coisas sempre foram muito naturais. É, embora o candomblé, por exemplo, seja uma religião muito mal vista no Brasil, não é uma religião aceita como é, religiões é, brancas, como catolicismo, protestantismo e etc. Então, ao longo da história, o, a população negra no Brasil sempre teve que lutar muito para se autoafirmar na sociedade e fazer valer um de, é, direitos natos de professar sua religiosidade, sua espiritualidade, enfim, às vezes até, muitas vezes, sei lá, na década de 20, é, não se podia se reunir para tocar os instrumentos de percussão, porque era crime. Então, ao longo dos anos, essa luta foi se tornando cada vez mais forte e eu acredito que o meu trabalho é um trabalho de ressignificação de existência, porque eu estou aqui e eu preciso fazer com que a minha vida seja uma vida fácil, uma vida normal, né? a tentativa disso, pelo menos. É, e através dessa reconexão, estudando a minha ancestralidade, eu acredito que eu me sinto mais poderosa, né? o que no candomblé a gente chama de axé, que é essa energia que, que, que nos cobre, que os orixás é, nos presenteia quando a gente está em conexão com eles. É, através desse, desse axé eu me sinto mais forte, Apesar de, do, do externo, né, da sociedade, dizer que não, você pode isso, você não pode aquilo, a violência, o genocídio da população negra é, só aumentar e o trabalho, meu trabalho artístico é para me colocar em algum lugar no mundo, meu trabalho me coloca num lugar no mundo. É, e eu sinto que, naturalmente, essa, essas entidades, elas aparecem no meu trabalho, é, para quem me chamas, por exemplo, é uma música que fala é, sobre, que questiona a apropriação cultural. Exu pergunta, por que tu me chamas se não me conhece? É, questionando essa, esse envolvimento, essa apropriação diretamente, dizendo da, dos símbolos e absolutamente tudo que existe na cultura brasileira em detrimento do corpo negro. Então, é, a gente está ainda na, na mira da bala, é, vivendo em situações extremas de pobreza. É, quando em festas populares ou pessoas da alta sociedade resolvem usar símbolos, enfim, na negação desse racismo que existe no Brasil. O, o Brasil ainda é uma colônia né, de países imperialistas e naturalmente expressa isso muito bem na ausência de pessoas negras, na, tanto na estrutura, em, em espaços de poder, quanto nas mídias e, e etc. Então, hoje a gente vem vivendo um, um momento aí de discussões, não só no Brasil como no mundo, muito também, é, é, como é que fala? Estimulado pelos movimentos sociais que vêm eclodindo nos Estados Unidos, mas o meu processo especificamente é sobre isso, entender como eu me coloco nesse país que é tão racista e que é tão negligente com as pessoas negras, como é que eu fico nisso, como é que eu influencio as pessoas é, que escutam meu trabalho a pensarem a respeito disso, tanto as pessoas negras quanto as pessoas brancas, e a gente criar uma, uma discussão em outro nível para que a gente realmente consiga mudar de fase é, o Brasil existe, a invenção do Brasil aconteceu há 500 anos e a gente ainda está aqui discutindo é, coisas tão primárias. Ai, desculpa, agora eu falei horrores, eu saí falando. Jenny disse que ela falou muito, então vamos Obrigada. De uh, nada. Então, o seu trabalho é uma... 
of uh, a work of restructuring uh, resistance. And in Zhenya's life, in her environment in Bahia, Bahia breathes, lives ancestrality. In the capital, Salvador, um, which is famous throughout Brazil, maybe the most famous city, um, in Salvador, you see images of Orishas all over. And Orishas there you see represent images in nature. So Yemanja, for example, represents the, the waters, the ocean, and others represent other things in, in nature. So seeing the Orishas was a very natural thing in, in her world. <clears throat> but um, Candomblé is seen as a, which is the religion where Orishas are, is seen as a very negative thing in Brazil and was generally not accepted um, or not as accepted as white religion, such as Catholic religion. And um, Afro-Brazilians or Black Brazilians had to fight and contest to have what are generally um, natural born rights of practicing religion. So much so that in the 1920s, um, Black peoples in, in, in Brazil couldn't even practice uh, percussion instruments because they were considered a crime playing them in public. And, um, and so there's been a very engaging fight since then to, to gain back a position in society. And that's the work that Zhenya does is about, is about that, is about finding a place in society um, for herself. And it's a way of connecting with um, Ashe, which is an energy, it's a form of energy in, in that religion, in Kandomblé. And it also represents an energy that you receive from the Orishas, from the entities, when you are connected to them. Um, <clears throat> So uh, she, she works to see, in her work, she uses the religion um, to find, uh, find her place in society. And that's what you see in the clip uh, that was shown in the beginning, Pra Que Me Chamas, Why Do You Call Me? That's uh, an Orisha that is actually asking the question to the audience. And it refers to cultural appropriation and it refers to cultural appropriation specifically in Brazil. Why is it the Brazilians, um, and specifically white Brazilians, use these black symbols when they've always been used as negative signs of oppression, but they use them when they're in festivities as something positive. And uh, you still see in Brazil uh, poverty and violence against uh, the black peoples. And Brazil, in fact, is very much still a colonized country. <clears throat> And um, you see this by the representation or lack thereof of Black peoples in the media, but also the lack of their representation in positions of power in society. U.S. movements uh, of Black consciousness have definitely helped move along this fight in Brazil, but Zhenya's work is about finding her place in society, making her, herself normal and not um, outlawed or out of place. And it's with this that she's able to continue this struggle and she's able to ask the audience why these cultural appropriation practices are happening and why these still happen 500 years later, they're still fighting for the same basic rights. Obrigada, Pablo. Thank you. The Orisha in question is called Exu Elegua, Elegbara, uh, is the first Orisha in the city. Thank you, Ashe. Uh, so I'm going through some of the audience questions and I have more questions than they align. So that's perfect. Um, so my next question is from the audience and also me, <laughs> but um, I'm curious in the midst of movements that are centered around black life and black liberation politics, as well as global civil unrest. Um, I'm curious of what role you think that black artists um, have throughout the diaspora to amplify these messages? And do you feel that there's a responsibility for Black artists to create art around racial issues? Um, let's let's start with Chanel. Actually, I'm sorry, let's start with Chanel because Chanel started first last time. Eu só preciso da pergunta porque eu me distraí. Então, pergunta da, da, do povo que está assistindo, é, em, em vista dos, dos movimentos tipo de Black Lives Matter e, e dos protestos mundiais também, em geral, é, qual é o papel do artista negro em é, dar voz a esses protestos 
e, segundo, se existe uma obrigação do artista negro representar isso na sua arte? Eu não acredito em, nessa, nesse conceito de dar voz a alguém. a alguém. Todo mundo tem a sua própria voz e eu acho que a gente chegou até aqui é, porque muitas pessoas vieram antes da gente e tiveram as suas vozes é, coadas até chegarem na gente. Eu me sinto realizando, eu me sinto um projeto, assim, um projeto político dos meus ancestrais. E acredito que como artista, como artista da música principalmente, porque é uma arte que junta muitas pessoas e a música como também uma manifestação da natureza, que é o som, um, tem a capacidade de passar pela gente sem pedir licença, né? É uma frequência de onda e que nos conecta, conecta os nossos Bluetooths juntos ali no momento da nossa, da nossa egrégora, por assim dizer. É, eu acredito que, politicamente, um corpo negro sempre é um corpo, um corpo negro numa sociedade, por exemplo, como o Brasil, de 56% de pessoas autodeclaradas é, descendentes de africanos, e hum, eu acredito que qualquer coisa, qualquer passo que uma pessoa negra decida tomar causa impacto na sociedade. Isso é um fato, independente da, independente da escolha da pessoa. Só de a gente conseguir tomar decisões que saiam das estatísticas, isso já faz uma grande diferença. Agora, em relação à mensagem e ao impacto que essa mensagem pode causar no público, eu acho que isso tem a ver com vários alinhamentos de planeta, assim, com vários fatores. É, o tempo que a gente está vivendo agora é muito propício para a gente discutir em tempo real essas questões com o uso da internet, das redes sociais, a gente fica sabendo de coisas que a gente não tinha tão, acesso tão rápido antes. Então... É, eu acredito que o, o, a internet ela acelera muito a comunicação entre pessoas de países diferentes e também a comunicação em, dentro do próprio país. É, esse é um fator que eu acho assim, bastante determinante, fora as lutas que já foram travadas anteriormente e que eclodem agora nessa possibilidade que esse assunto ele não é um assunto novo, é um assunto muito urgente, muita gente já morreu, Muita gente ainda vive em condições extremas de, de, de vida, assim, que a gente pode até hesitar em chamar de vida. É, e a gente precisa e precisava muito que acontecesse essa comoção global a respeito é, das vidas negras. Então, eu acredito que o papel do artista nesse lugar é, talvez, não de dar voz, mas de amplificar um discurso e levar essa mensagem, que eu acho que é mais um papel da música do que do artista em si. Mas sim, o posicionamento, o posicionamento é, artístico ele é crucial, pensando que a gente está lidando com muito mais gente do que eu, Xênia, sozinha, né? Eu, pessoa física, por assim dizer, a pessoa jurídica é, move muito mais pessoas. Então, isso é a coisa mais importante é, a se pensar e usar esse discurso também com muita responsabilidade, porque eu acredito que ainda existem questionamentos muito primários, mas que existem coisas que já, já vêm sendo faladas há tanto tempo que eu sinto que já chegou a hora de a gente passar de fase na, discu na discussão e principalmente sair da discussão e ir para a prática, com certeza, isso é um fato. Okay, so uh, Jane explains it. Um, she doesn't believe that we or that she needs to or the artist needs to give voice to other people. Everyone has their own voice. And there have been many other peoples before us that had to struggle. And that all comes down through into us. Um, and um, Jane believes that she's a, she's a political product of her ancestors and that music Uh, will bring together different peoples. Music is also a reflection of nature. So <clears throat> all of this goes through um, the artist and it comes out when we're in practice um, because of the history, but not because of the individuals. And now, politically speaking, the black body is always in protest. Um, no matter the person's beliefs or political ideology, any action that a black person take has an impact. Uh, no matter, no matter what, especially when they're getting out of the typical and the statistics that we see in society. 
Um, and um, in terms of, of messaging, um, these aren't new messages with the protests that are coming out. They're all very important, but, uh, but it is a struggle that, um, that we're seeing that still needs to be, needs to be um, confronted. Um, one thing that's interesting is that now we can converse in real time with each other. Because of the internet, we're having all these discussions and we're able to have a real discourse, which is um, very important. Um, but these, these struggles that we're having today about Black lives are not new. <clears throat> What's new is that we're able to have more discussions. Um, there have been many people that have died along the way and that we're struggling just as we are today. <clears throat> um, but we need these protests and um, the work of music is really um, to let these, these movements come through us, but it's not dependent um, on the individual, rather it's dependent on the practice. Um, however, you know, this discourse is, is important and it's important to use it uh, responsibly so that we can, um, we can continue to amplify the messages of protest. Thank you so much, I really appreciated that, that answer. Um, Chanel. Everything Jinya said. Um, <laughs> <laughs> for serious, yeah. I mean, I don't think I. I'm in total agreement that um, um, just the uh, yes, the black body um, and the black artists just creating the work is a revolutionary act in in and of it, in and of itself. So, um, you know, for an artist, a black artist to disrupt white spaces with their work is a revolutionary act as well. Um, but I do believe, um, strongly believe that we should all um, aspire and work to actively work towards looking um, through an anti-racism um, lens like we all all of us no matter what role we decide to take part to, to call ourselves in society um, have a role in dismantling racist systems and systems of oppression period with the t at the end um, and you know as far as as black artists I mean I think about um, the birth of, of black museums right? Um, many Black museums throughout the country opened post-civil rights era, post-Black power era, and they were, my, the museum that I work at, the Banneker Douglas Museum, um, uh, Verda Freeman Welcome, she was the first, I'm sorry, the second African-American woman senator in the nation, and she survived an assassination attempt. Okay, just because she was running for Senate and she was a black woman. And she opened the Banneker Douglas Museum or led the legislation to open the Banneker Douglas Museum because she believed that um, the presentation of black history and culture, the authentic presentation of black history and culture is a tool to um, heal Maryland from its deep roots of racism, to uproot racism in Maryland. Because how can you really hate somebody if you authentically know their history and culture, right? Um, so those are the, one of the shoulders that I stand on. Um, and as far as Black art, I mean, Black artists have been documenting Black social justice movements in this country since we got here, be it the black folk artists who are unnamed to the big names that we know, such as the Romare Beardens, such as the Jacob Lawrence, such as the Elizabeth Catlets, such as the Kehinde Wileys and Amy Sherrills. Um, so that's really nothing new, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so I don't know if I answered your question, but I'm just in my role, I'm excited to be a black artist, but also give a platform for other artists to showcase their interpretations of their own personal experiences within social justice movements and or just their own personal experience in general, which is of course to present that as a re revolutionary act. Right. 
Thank you. I have, I have one more thing about it. Yes. Um, eu também acredito que um, só a representação artística, principalmente no caso do Brasil, é, não tem a força do tamanho do problema. Nós somos um país de mais de 200 milhões de brasileiros com mais da metade da população é, descendente de africanos escravizados. A estrutura social ela é toda comprometida e por causa disso. E eu acredito que se a gente fica só na representação, a gente cai na armadilha de só é, causar impacto imageticamente. Só que a gente precisa de pessoas negras fazendo escolhas na sociedade, nas estruturas, dentro do direito, enfim, nas escolas públicas. A gente precisa de uma educação honesta que conte a história do Brasil, como ela realmente é, porque, do contrário, a gente vai passar mais 500 anos só é, fazendo coisas é, que causam impacto num determinado ponto. A arte é política, a arte existe para isso também. Porém, efetivamente, na prática, a gente precisa de pessoas negras na estrutura do país, tomando novos, novas, fazendo novas escolhas, fazendo novas decisões que beneficiem essa maioria que ainda é tão fragilizada e que é morta a cada 10 minutos, um jovem negro, um jovem negro é morto a cada 10 minutos no Brasil. Isso é muito grave. Então, eu acredito que a representação artística ela tem um valor, mas, infelizmente, a gente só consegue ir em frente com, com medidas mais práticas e mais honestas é, estruturalmente. Okay, so, Jenny had one more thing to, to add, which is that just having the representation, especially in a country like Brazil, um, doesn't really uh, convey the strength of change that the size of the problem uh, demands. In Brazil, you have, you have over 200 million Brazilians, and more than half of them are descended from enslaved peoples. And this affects uh, to the detriment of societal structure today. So um, if you only have representation and you only get a visual impact of that representation, then um, you're not really uh, creating the amount of impact that you need in that. What you really need is to have um, change in the social structures and in institutions, in schools, in positions of power, in politics, to be able to convey the history and tell the story of why things are the way they are today and to make change. And if you don't do this, you'll just have another, another 500 years of repression and problems. So, um, and in, in that, to that end, uh, the impact that we're seeing in art, if it's only in that one area, then you can't change other areas. So for example, um, uh, Blacks and Brazilian social in society, um, you have every 10 minutes a young Black man or young black person dying in Brazil. So in, in that sense, artistic representation has value, but we need something that's a little more uh, practical also. Um, I'm so appreciative of both you, Janya and Chanel for sharing your art, your words, your wisdom with us, for sharing your ancestors with us and your spirits. So I'm very, very grateful to be able to hold this conversation and thank you to um, Pablo and everyone else who helped put this uh, together for all of us. And I want to say that this portion is over, but we have a virtual lobby after this, which is basically we're trying to simulate, you know, the art let out. So when we're in the lobby and we leave the art show, so um, that will be in the chat for everyone. If you want to just kind of mingle, virtually mingle for, for a little bit, uh, that will be open. But I want to say thank you again. And I'm going to turn it over to, I believe, Jane. Can I just say really quickly, Juju, thank you so much for moderating. Thank you, Ju thank you Juju. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you. And thank you, Xenia. Um, I listened to your podcast now, Juju, which is amazing and incredibly healing. And Genia, I listen to your music and it's just 
everything. So I love so I love your honor. work, and I and I hope one day I uh, could uh, have one obra obra de arte masterpiece, your masterpiece in my, yeah. in my home. I would love that. Send me your address. It's my dream. <laughs> It's my dream. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Juju. You're amazing. You're so, so, so Thanks. gorgeous and, and intelligent. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Obrigada. Thank you. <laughs> De nada. <laughs> um, thank you.